On October 5th, the Circuit Climbing Gym in Tigard, Oregon hosted their annual popular Portland Boulder Rally, and this year they made a lot of changes to the format. The guy behind those format changes is who is joining me right now, Garrett Greger of Complex Climbing. Uh, thanks for making time so early in the morning to talk about bouldering formats of all things. Uh, how are you doing, Garrett? Absolutely, Tyler. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Uh, I'm doing great. Uh, it is early. It's about 7.30 here my time, but I love talking about these things, and so um, I'm happy to be on, share them with you guys and uh, with your followers. So let's, thanks for uh, me. Let's do it once a week. It's a perfect way to wake up on a, on a Tuesday yeah. morning, right? <laughs> great. Uh, great. I'll pencil it in. Yeah. So um, first of all, how did you end up in a position to not just set for this comp, but also to rewrite the format for, uh, for like, it's a popular comp series, right? And, or event That's at right. least. Um, so it's kind of unusual for them to reach out and say, Hey, we just want to do something totally different. How did this all come together? So Portland, Portland Boulder Rally reached out to me. Um, Chloe Mandel was the event organizer and, I had set this event back in 2017, I believe, and back then it was, I mean, Portland Boulder Rally Forever has been this huge comp series that goes on in the Northeast. Uh, they have upwards of 350, 400 competitors, I think, that roll through, sometimes in uh, single sessions. Uh, they set over 100 Boulder problems for their members at this comp, uh, or, or their competitors, rather, at this comp. And on top of that, they have this professional format uh, or professional competition that they uh, put on. And so, yeah, I'd, I'd done it in 2017. I'd skipped out in 2018 because uh, I had too many things going on. But in 2019, uh, it just so happened that I was able to take advantage of it. And next year is the 10-year anniversary of PBR. So, they were looking to do something new to spice it up, but they didn't know quite what. And for me, I've been involved in competitions. I've been resetting for almost 15 years and climbing for 20, and I've been involved in competitions for the majority of that. And so I've seen a lot of different things go on within competitions, and uh, this was an opportunity for me to be like, hey, I've thought about a lot of this stuff and uh, have a new sort of idea that we can play with. And I pitched it to them and they were totally on board with it and we're happy to try something new and different and uh, see how it went. Cool. So before I bring up the details of the, of the format that you guys tried, uh, for the most part, format tweaks are usually the product of not being happy with something about how comps run, right? There's kind of like you, you sense a problem and so you try and make a fix for it. So, before we go into the details, when you look at competition bouldering, what are those little things that drive you nuts that you feel either make it not fair or not fun or not functional or not great to watch? Like what were uh, what were the sticking points for you that you wanted to try and improve? Yeah, so I, I like to look at things as it's not necessarily problems. It's more of things that we could do better, right? It's, I think based on the fact that we've seen such an explosion in competition climbing, such a explosion in, in climbing in general and in, in America and in, in North America and the world really over the past several years, uh, that, that there's just little things that we could tweak to, to make a little bit better. And, and one of those things for me that stood out was watching somebody in, in finals, watching somebody sit and figure out the problem on the ground and have to maybe take a minute and a half, two minute rest, uh, more than just figuring it out, having to take that rest time. And then we sit there as the audience and watch them do that instead of just watching climbing, which is what we're there to watch. Um, it would be like watching the players for, uh, I, I use a lot of sports analogies, so forgive me, but uh, it, it would be like watching the players at halftime in the locker room for 30 minutes instead of watching or, or going and grabbing food or watching the cheerleaders or watching um, a recap of what had happened or watching the halftime show, uh, we we are left with sort of just this downtime. And, and that was one of the things I really wanted to get at. Cool. Well, let's uh, let's go into the, the format itself. So I'm just going to pull up, first of all, bullet points of what was 
uh, the usual. So first of all, you guys had a red point qualifier leading to the top six men and the top six women proceeding on to finals. Uh, you ran the women's final first. And when that was finished, we went to the men's final. And lastly, it was a four problem final using uh, USA scoring or uh, I've got a multi zone scoring, multi zone scoring. Cool. Yeah. Daddy Danielson's progression <laughs> obsession is, uh, yeah, is <laughs> sure you've had or wanted to have on here. <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay. And then uh, let's talk about what was new. So uh, first, the finalists were able to practice the finals problems uh, before finals started. So they were able to get on them, play around on them. Uh, and that spoiler made it so you don't need to have a preview time for the competition. Uh, secondly, there was no isolation before or during finals, uh, which meant that the climbers got to see each other climb. And therefore, you don't have to worry about beta rules um, because everybody can see everything. The crowd can shout beta. The climbers can shout beta to each other. Uh, number three, climbers only get one attempt at a time with a one minute, 30 second time limit on that attempt. And when your attempt was done, the next climber got an attempt. So you were just constantly getting climbers back to back to back. And the climbers had a maximum of three attempts per problem. So if you didn't uh, flash the problem on your first attempt, you would have a second and then a third if you needed it. And then uh, number five, this was an elimination comp. So after the first two problems, uh, you had the two climbers at the bottom were cut, leaving just four. After the third problem, you cut two more so that in the fourth and final problem, you only had two competitors going head to head. And then lastly, the climbers were reseeded after uh, it was each elimination, right? You reseeded after the first two problems and then again after the third problem. So you always had the That's top exactly seed right. going out last. Yeah. Okay. So I'm going to shuffle this stuff Nailed it. over my side. See, I'm killing it, man. I got Sounds it. Sounds like you it's, wrote it. It's early, but we got it. Uh, okay. So I would like you to just walk us through um, these different points and, uh, yeah. if there were different versions of these changes that you, uh, maybe had, but why you settled on this format? Yeah. The, um, the only, the, what, what I settled on again, uh, as I mentioned before is, uh, one of the things we wanted to eliminate was downtime. Another thing we wanted to eliminate was, uh, being able to share beta. Uh, so in, in a traditional finals format and traditional format in general, you're not able to give the climbers beta while they're on the wall. And I'll use another sports analogy. It would be like going to a soccer game and not being able to yell pass. Uh, and so we wanted to get that sort of audience engagement um, and, and allow them to interact with the climbers in a way and be able to show, show the the competitors uh, something different in that, you know, them shouting beta doesn't necessarily affect them. Um, and yeah, it, but again, like m the, the main point being that the audience is allowed to like really, really say whatever they want. And instead of just being like, come on, or what can we get say, or uh, they're, they're free to do whatever they want. Um, and so the, the downtime, and the audience engagement was a big thing. Um, another thing that we wanted to focus on was this idea of it being a practiced element. Um, and, and I think this is one of the things that I would, you know, we can come back to, but one of the things that I would change because during the day there was this element of uh, we, the, all the climbers were able to play on the finals boulders, not just the open competitors, but also any citizens competitors were able to play on the practice boulders. And I thought that it would be a way for the audience again or, or the climbers throughout the day to feel more engaged and say like, wow, how are they going to climb that during finals? That, that thing feels impossible. Um, and be able to climb on it with Megan Martin or climb on it with Matt Fultz. So... Just, um, just really quick. So you were saying not just the finalists were climbing on the final. So the finals were up all day and you had potential finalists, but also just like everybody who wanted to could hop on these problems and just like project them as much as they wanted. Yeah, that was, that was one of the hopes uh, was okay. that they would be able to, to jump on the things. It didn't quite work out that way. I think because the red point round was so hectic. Okay. That, the, a lot of the citizens competitors were just kind of like 
uh, I'm trying to get all my own climbs or maybe it wasn't uh, expressed to them or, or relayed to them uh, quite well enough. Uh, but that was one of the hopes was that there would be like a little bit more engagement on that end. Okay. So well. were they like, were they constantly busy? Were there always climbers on them throughout the day or was it, was it less traffic on them than you hoped for? It was, I'd, I'd say for the men, there was a good amount of traffic throughout the session. So red point qualifiers were three hours long and the majority of the men started trying climbs probably about an hour in. Okay. And and that was kind of interspersed throughout, but they they gave a good amount of attempts throughout the round and and then the women um had a little bit tougher time I think finding the problems that they needed to do throughout the red point qualifier. Gotcha. So they didn't all attempt them as much as I'd hoped. Uh, but a fair amount of them attempted all of them, um, for probably the last hour okay. or so of the gotcha. red point qualifiers. Okay, cool. I'll let you go back to, uh, to what we were talking about with, the uh, with the actual uh, format itself. I just had to interject and find out. Yeah, no, I thought it was just an important point to add to the first point, which is finalists can practice the finals problems, mm-hmm. uh, and that anyone could indeed practice the finals problems. Um, but yeah, so the, the first point is that this becomes more of like a practice routine, more of like gymnastics in a way that the climbers practice the climbs and then they perform the climbs, uh, when it comes time for finals. Um, and that eliminates a lot of things like the, the element of preview. There's no need to preview anymore. There's no need to have four minutes where the climbers figure it out on the go. Right. Um, And so we can just distill it down in a way to their individual attempt. Um, It also eliminates the need for no isolation uh, before or during finals. We definitely had an area that was specific for the climbers so that they could warm up. Um, But as you mentioned, uh, or, or as that point mentions, Climbers were able to receive beta. Audience was able to give beta freely and, and cheer with whatever they wanted. Um, we settled on a minute 30 for their attempts, and this worked out really well. There was one problem in particular that was a little bit longer, and I, th- I believe Chloe came pretty close. Mm-hmm. Uh, Chloe and Megan came really close to utilizing all that time on one of the, the second boulder. Um, but otherwise it worked out really well. The idea there being that because it wasn't like a plus format, like we've seen in some comps in the, in the past, meaning that if somebody gets on, they can keep climbing, um, that there would be incentive for the climbers to get on as fast as possible since they only had 90 seconds. Right. And, and um, you know, a, a quick window for, for, or, or, or excuse me, not, not a quick window, but, um, ample window for the climbers to climb those climbs so um another thing we did in in figuring this out is i sort of kind of come through spreadsheets of how how many times does a competitor not get enough time um what is the average amount of time of a of a competitor's climb and from coaching all of these years from Uh, Being involved with competitions, we sort of settled on that 90 second window and thought, yeah, this is this is uh, about where we want it. You know, Um, the the, they had a maximum of three attempts per problem. And what this did is something I think that made the comp run really well is that instead of having those three attempts back to back where they needed to uh, to rest in between those attempts. Now what you had was you had one climber climbing. Um, they took their 90 seconds or whatever their climb was. The next climber then climbed and took their 90 seconds. The next climber climbed after that and took their 90 seconds or whatever it was, and so on and so forth. You had all climbers climbing six climbers in a row. And then at the end of that, the first climber came back in and had all of the rest from these two through uh, six climbers, 
Um, so their rest was effectively built in. We no longer have to watch that rest. Uh, we no longer have to sit. The audience rather doesn't have to sit there and see somebody just kind of standing on the ground, waiting around. Uh, we can cut directly to the climbing, and then we incentivize them to start climbing by only having that 90-second window. That um, one, uh, just just before ahead. we go on to that, that, w- that one was curious. Um, uh, sorry, I'm just trying to find the note I had about this. So the one situation was if you had, let's say, um, I think in the men's, around i can't remember which problem it was i think you had uh four people send one of the problems on their flash attempt and so only two climbers had to try it again on their second and third attempts and they Mm -hmm. were the bottom seeds so four of the climbers flashed it and had lots of time to rest and two of them had to try it two more times and they didn't end up sending it if i remember right maybe one of them did yeah Um, no i think you're right now the the guy who had to climb it three different times and didn't get a send was the bottom seed, so he then had to go out first uh, for the next problem. I think you ran a commercial break in between, if I if I remember right from the from the um, uh, from the broadcast. Did you guys have a mechanism in place to deal with that? Like I wasn't sure if you were being forced to pause the climbers because this stream was required to have a commercial break. Or if you guys were saying, okay, if this happens, we have this contingency, we guarantee them like a two minute rest before the the guy has to start the next problem. Did you have anything built in for that situation? Um, so there were a lot of things to, to balance out. And one of those was making sure that there was some rest time in between boulder problems so that somebody that found themselves in first from the first round and then were reseeded to being last after that first cut uh, needed to maybe have a little bit of rest time um, because they would have just climbed so built into the format and the sort of run a show document that i had originally pitched was okay we're going to go problem one all six climbers climb their three attempts then we're going to go problem two all six climbers climb their three attempts and then we're going to have three minutes built in for sort of uh, a little commercial break, or, or I think it ended up being two minutes built in for their cool. commercial break. Nice. Um, and I think there are ways to pace it out. You know, we can maybe do a little bit better when we come back in. Uh, we could probably still have another minute to sort of introduce this is what happened in the first two rounds, and and this is what's sort of on the table for going into problem three. Um, but yeah, that was that was the idea. Is that we would have a little bit of time built in, so cool. that the climbers would have some rest. Um, uh, the the other interesting thing to note about that that some people um, felt like was uh, strange about it, or, or or could come up rather, was that if a climber, if the top four, let's say, flashed, and then only five and six. Uh, had to try again, that they would be forced to just try again on top of one another. Mm-hmm. And and we saw this in if they were able to go head to head, that they would have had to try back to back to back to back. And in my mind, I wasn't all that worried about it. I co- sort of thought through this in that if we add up their three attempts at 90 seconds each, we're at 270 seconds, which is uh, effectively um, uh, 30 seconds more than uh, four and a half minutes, 30 seconds more than what they would normally have during a finals round. Okay. Um, and in that finals round, they would only have four minutes and they would have to try as many times as they wanted within that four minutes anyways. So in my mind, it wasn't that uh, big of a, a gap from what they would have normally gone through. It was more just sort of restructuring Uh, And if anything, it was giving them more rest because the climber ahead of them would climb and then they would have their 90 seconds to climb. And they had the discretion if they wanted to, like uh, when your attempt started, you would be allowed to hypothetically run down the clock as much as you wanted to rest, right? If you have a 90 second window, you can rest for 60 and then climb for 30. Um, So yeah, okay. That's not that bad then. Cool. Yeah, that's exactly right. All right. And then talk to me about elimination, Um, seeing more comps start using kind of elimination format. What are the strengths of that that made you want to uh, use that kind of um, uh, format for this? 
I'm sorry. Uh, you cut off for just a second, Tower. My, yeah. my apologies. Uh, no worries. You said something before the the strengths of the format. Yeah. So that... okay. So yeah, my question is is just about uh, the fact that you chose to use an elimination format. Why uh, Why did you decide to use something like that? This was another thing for the audience, um, and and so as you can tell, like a lot of the things I was trying to do were for the audience and uh, and and for the climbers. Um, but for the climbers to be able to show themselves as the best climbers. And for the audience to really be able to follow along the action and be able to be engaged in the action. And the elimination format, I think, what it does really well is without knowing the scoreboard, uh, without knowing what happened before or during the day, during red point qualifiers, it tells the audience immediately the stakes at hand. So if in the first two problems, there's six people who could possibly win. And then after problem two, we cut two down and we know that those two climbers, we don't know their scores. We don't even know where they ended up, but we know that those two climbers were the the lowest ranked climbers. Uh, going into problem, problem three, we have four climbers left that are potentially vying for that first uh, spot. And, and then we cut two more and the audience inherently understands that on problem four, we're left with just two people and one of them is going to win. And so um, I think it's one of the things that is missing from our our sport in general uh, is a, a scoreboard, <laughs> a live no scoreboard. No kidding, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I always say like if you turned on a soccer game and all you saw was a little clock in the bottom right-hand corner – you you don't feel as though you you understand anything totally. you you are left with which teams are playing um and you know if somebody scores a goal well what did that mean mm -hmm. um and so we're in, in climbing we're and we're getting there but we're presented with this problem of we don't know who's on the wall and we don't know what their scores are and so in any format that you choose it's it's really important that the climbers on on the stage are being represented. That we know that it's Megan Martin up there. We know that it's Matt Foltz up there, uh, and and so the audience is able to really latch on to that personality and that person that's up there. Um, and then we want to be able to see their scores. So we know that going into problem four, it's seventy five to seventy four point nine. And that Carlo needs to do, it didn't quite work out that way, <laughs> um, but uh, we know that Carlo has to flash this in order to keep his lead. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, yeah, I, I think that there are, there are people that are thinking about this and trying to do better. I don't know if you, you follow, I'm sure you follow along the comp scene pretty mm -hmm. well, but uh, if you watched Edinburgh finals or if any of you out there mm -hmm. watched Edinburgh uh, the European World Champ, excuse me, European Championship lead finals. Um, there was a really great producer on hand, different from the regular IFSC producers that thinks about a lot of these things that we're talking about, how to present this to the audience, and they listed right at the bottom uh, the climber's name. Um, they even had at the beginning while the climber was coming out their stats, uh, the highest World Cup ranking they they had achieved, and. Um, and then on the side, which was the most interesting to me, was they had a little ticker where um, at the very bottom was zero. And then as the climber uh, started <laughs> climbing up, they would get higher and higher. And along the way, you would see like, OK, just above him is Alberto Guinness Lopez. And uh, he has a score of 37. And you see Adam catching up to him little by little, 35, 36 and then 37, and then continuing to build up from there. I need to go watch this. You would almost, like, it's so frustrating. Like, I would never think to watch a European championship for the most part, because there is a lot of comp climbing out there. And so in your head, you're like, okay, well, I'll watch the World Cups. That will be the best of the best. But then you, it's stuff like this, right, where so much of the broadcasting is uh, these regional companies. You never know who's going to do a great mm -hmm. job of it. I'm curious if those are the same people that do the, uh, like, the, the British bouldering nationals, because they also did an excellent job, uh, especially in the last two years of visualizing scores and always having uh, contextual info on the screen but yeah i'll have to go back and watch that that sounds amazing yeah yeah they, they did a really great job and 
Um, you know, obviously there's there's still things that could be better. I think some of the angles, uh, there's oftentimes just a, a backed up angle from the climber. So we're just kind of seeing that. Uh, and not so much focus on the hands or specific movements, but all that comes with more cameras and more time. But mm-hmm. the real important thing I think was that they show, uh, as you mentioned, they give context for the climbers and yeah. so that, or for, excuse me, for the audience. And so then the audience is able to really engage. And I, I showed it to a friend and they're able to jump in right from anywhere in that broadcast and know, Oh, Adam's Adam's at 35 right now and he's got to get to 36. And mm-hmm. it's, it's easy. It's easy. So I, I'm not sure if, if you're using the elimination format just to make it easier to watch and like just to make sure there's always context. But like you having root set for so long, you understand that the fewer boulders you put in front of a climber, the more risk and the more... Um, it, it forces the root setters to have a really good day, right? If you want to eliminate kind of the best climbers, you can knock out the two top seeds right off the first two problems if those two problems are are not quite what you expected, right? So I'm sure you'd agree that it is kind of more pressure on you guys to make sure that all of those climbs are very fair, however you decide to judge that, um, mm-hmm. and, and extremely effective at separating the field in the way you want to. Um, do you feel like that's kind of a sustainable thing for climbing? Because I, I just find that it puts so much of the success of athletes in the hands of the root setters uh, when you have fewer and fewer problems determining like their fate. Yeah. So the, what was really interesting for me, I think there's a couple ways to unpack that. Um, the first is that in this format, what we were able to do is as uh, as red point qualifiers went on and this was an added bonus, if you will, um, the root setters were able to gauge a little bit more objectively what the climbers were doing throughout the red point round as they tried those finals problems. So we were able to see and identify a little bit better potential, uh, bottlenecks, potential skips, um, potential, uh, whatever whatever might have come up, um, areas the climbers might have rested that would factor into this, um, and then adjust before finals. Oh, so there okay. Was, yeah, so there was there was definitely we had allotted ourselves this sort of uh, ability to say, uh, you know, climbers, we we may change things. Uh, it was our hope that we wouldn't change much, if anything, um, but it did give us that opportunity to more objectively assess rather than as everyone knows that that root sets it's it's just estimating mm-hmm. and even the best estimators uh it's kind of like baseball you, you, you know if if you're hitting a a point three you you're you're pretty good <laughs> yeah at that point so um, so you managed to solve the like the, the perennial problem of root setting is not being able to find forerunners for comps. And you're just like, <laughs> okay, we're just going to take the competitors and we're going to use them as forerunners. That's pretty unreal yeah, that you managed yeah, that. <laughs> Good stuff. Um, and, and I wouldn't say there's still an element of it that's guessing, you know, that for instance, and this is one of the things that I think we could have done a better job at conveying. And one of the things that um, was a surprise to me, but during the red point and qualifiers, none of the, uh, I wouldn't say none of the climbers topped. Uh, there were a few of the climbers that topped, but Carlo, for instance, did not top, uh, maybe two or three out of the four boulders that were there. Okay. And so there was this idea of like, Oh, maybe they're a little bit too easy. Um, but you know, in my mind it was more like, okay, well, the climbers still have to go out there and perform. And that was one of the goals of it is that it was this practice thing and that they would go out and perform that. And however it worked out that, you know, maybe they, they had, uh, maybe they did all flash them in finals, which is what it ended up to be. Alex and Alex and Carla both came out and, uh, quote unquote flashed, mm-hmm. uh, day flashed, yeah. if you will. <laughs> um, uh, but yeah, they came out and did them first try and so there was the storyline under that that didn't get told. And that's one of the things I think we could have done better is showing them working them during the day and showing Carlo not, not getting to the top of many of the boulder problems and then having to come out in that moment 
and the audience being able to understand that and say like, who is he going to be able to do it right now? Um, because That's a really watching good point. On, yeah. yeah watching that him on Prop 4, uh, you didn't know that Carlo hadn't done this, but I knew and I saw how hard he tried on problem four and it was, it was really special. Yeah. Okay. That's, that's really interesting. Cause you're right. Having watched it, I didn't have that context at all. And so you come out of it feeling like, Oh, the men's round was like pretty soft. And especially yeah. for, for Carlo, it was, uh, it didn't look like it was, uh, it was that much of a challenge, but that kind of thing would have absolutely added all this different context and a little bit of doubt each time he came out to climb. Right. Um, so a couple points on the, on the fact that they got to rehearse these climbs. Um, first yeah. one is, uh, after the comp was over, uh, there was an interview with uh, Maya Madeira, and she was talking about that she felt she had the opportunity to spend so much time on the finals climbs uh, because she, I guess, she finished her red point scorecard relatively early. So I think she had an hour or more. And she said she got mm-hmm. to climb many, many attempts uh, on all of these finals boulders, whereas some of the other female finalists probably just squeaked into the finals. And so they were probably in the red point round right till the end and had barely any uh room to practice uh how how can you argue for that to be like a fair setup for uh for a finals round um so i i heard this point for sure and and i can i can definitely relate and empathize to the climbers that say like oh maya had way more time to climb but the the way i justify it i guess is by saying that maya had more time because she performed better um, and if you watch a formula one race, they, they have more time to practice if they don't have things go wrong, uh, during their practice rounds. And some people don't end up with qualifying times and they're put at the back of the pack. And that's, that's sort of just the way it goes. So if, if a climber wants more time on those climbs, they're allotted as much of that three hours as they possibly want. And the fact that Mike performed better and was able to, um, w- was able to give herself that opportunity, she earned it. It wasn't the format that earned it for her. It was the fact that she earned it for her. Now, that being said, uh, I think there are things that we could do better during red point qualifiers. It would be really cool if the climbers knew where they were ranked as they were going, if we had live scoring for qualifiers. So they could see like, oh, I'm in second. It's it, There's only an hour left. I'm pretty safe in order to get into finals i'm, I'm gonna maybe start trying the bowlers right. um instead of them tr- sort of just guessing at it um maybe giving a specific 30 minute session for those uh, finals climbers to to work those climbs instead of integrating them into the red point qualifiers um i still like the idea of any citizens competitors being able to climb on the finals pro- problems with a Matt Folds, with a Megan Martin, with a Maya Madeer. Um, but given that everybody's sort of like vying for their own spot in citizens or in pro finals, uh, it, it didn't quite work out that way. So maybe a, a specific window for the finalists to work those problems would be better. Um, that okay. presents its own challenges, like sure. you know where to fit it in logistically with the three other sessions that are going on yeah. throughout the day. The schedule for the PBR is unreal. Like every time I look at <laughs> just the, how the day runs, it knocks me out. You know, like we've you know we've all run you know whatever our our local home gym comp or whatever, and and it seems unmanageable just with maybe one or two sessions. And they yeah they must do an amazing <laughs> job out there. Uh, but my other point about the uh, ability to practice was. Um, right off the top, as I ran through these things, you instantly uh, drew an analogy to gymnastics, um, the idea of having to perform a task that you're able to practice, right? Um, And I think uh, the ability to practice a boulder ahead of time or a climb ahead of time is, is like a pretty big paradigm shift for competition climbing. Pretty much all of it, aside from speed climbing, doesn't allow for that. At most, you get preview. So we're pretty entrenched in the idea that when you compete on a climb, it's your first time doing it. Uh, but you seem pretty comfortable with that kind of uh, with that kind of change in ideals. The idea that the climbing might be more about your performance in that given time rather than all of it putting together your your first attempt and your strategy and all that kind of stuff. Um, do you think that is the kind of change that you'd be okay with seeing in competition climbing? Um, potentially all the way up to a world cup level? Like, is that the kind of change in how we think about 
competitive climbing that would make it better? Uh, I'd say, I'd say two things. I'd say one, you know, we started this conversation with, you know, what are the problems of, of competition climbing in its current format? Right. And I think there's just things we could do better or we could do different, not necessarily, um, that it has to be one way or the other. So in my mind, I think we're the sport of climbing uh, and we call it sport climbing competitions, or at least that's what it's being referred to in the Olympic realm, sport climbing. Um, I think sport climbing is its own thing. It's, it's not meant to be rock climbing. It's a totally different thing. And so the idea that you practice something and then go perform it, that's a total, that's a sports thing. Um, and I think that I, uh, at least am comfortable with heading that direction if it's an element of it, because I do think that there's still something really special about going out and on uh, a climb and figuring it out on the fly. And so in my mind, I think where climbing could be headed is, uh, again, a little bit analogous to gymnastics, where maybe you have this sort of overall title for the climbers to win, where part of what they could win is the on-site round, and part of what they could win is the lead climbing discipline, and part of it is the speed climbing discipline. But then you could have other disciplines that you tack on as well. You could have a campus competition. Oh, you could have a dyno competition. <laughs> you could have uh, this this sort of flash format uh, competition where they, they practice something and perform it. Um, and you become this sort of like overall – uh, athlete, uh, mm-hmm. so to speak, not, not this combined athlete of, of boulder lead and speed, but, um, so we're stretching know, the, the like climbing triathlon idea. We're stretching yeah. that out to like the climbing decathlon or something. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Um, and it, you know, it's just, uh, maybe, a, a far off idea, but I think it's somewhere we could go with it. Uh, and somewhere that the sport currently has other things that we do like dynoing, like campusing, like, uh, uh, hangboarding, uh, feats of strength that, that we could practice and perform. Um, and it doesn't have to always be about who can figure it out within four minutes. Um, a few comps are, are using this kind of idea of practicing the climbs in advance. So, uh, like last, uh, legends only, which I don't know if is going to run anymore. Um, but that was an event where the climbers had a part in setting the problems, uh, but then also getting to climb each other's, uh, climbs of the few comps that have done this and of the, like of the few that you've watched, not necessarily saying you've watched all of them. Uh, do you think that element has made it a better show? And it's, it's really hard to judge because there are so few comps and there are so many moving parts of a competition that can change things. Um, but are you willing to say at this point that you feel like that element of practice has made the comp better yet or are you still waiting to find out i think that uh even in those formats and and even in the pbr format that we just ran there's that element of the story that needs to be told so uh and i think legends only did a, a pretty good job at showing them in the work session trying to figure it out and and then we were able to see those climbers in finals uh actually performing it um i think they They do a really good job at it, Um, but I I still think we could do better at showing what's on the line before each climb um, and and then seeing the the climbers perform those tasks. So, um, yes, they do a really good job at it, uh, but I I still think there's, there's room for improvement. Okay, cool. Um, so we just kind of breaking off from the from the root setting and the format itself. Uh, we've talked now about the idea of telling a story, which ultimately comes down to the broadcast team. We've talked about trying to give an audience um, pers- or um, context, which comes down context. to kind of your your inform your IT team, your scoring app if you have one, your mm-hmm. just your broadcast team as well. It integrates both of those. Um, you've worked with a lot of different people. You've worked with the IFSC and uh, like various comps, uh, which usually employ like uh, separate little broadcasters. You worked with uh, Chloe Mandel, I guess, for this event. Um, have you like, it's getting to the point where if we want to run these comps, uh, in our the comps of our dreams where it's as great to watch on the floor as it is to watch at home and it 
hopefully something that replicates like a, a big time sports experience. Are you starting to find people that you can work with where you're like, yeah, they share the same level of vision or this gym shares the same idea of the amount of funding we need to put into it to, to get that kind of show. Like, are you starting to see more people willing to invest in that full product? The PBR thing I find interesting because they, they have an event uh, coordinator, right? They've hired somebody mm -hmm. from outside the gym to run the event, which is unique in itself. Um, are you hopeful that more places are investing in this or are you still feeling uh, like it's going to be a while off before we get that kind of uh, competition? I'm hopeful that these sorts of things are going to come to fruition in, in the near future. I think there's lots of people thinking about it, about how to present it to the audience and uh, how to, to better uh, fill those gaps, um, scoring, uh, conveying it to the audience, the storyline. Um, and I, I don't think it's that far off. Uh, you know, Edinburgh is a perfect example. There's plenty of smart people out there mm -hmm. that are working on things and, and putting them into practice, uh, or, or at least testing them, excuse me, testing them out. Um, so I, I don't think it's all that far off. And I think, as we've seen with the prevalence of climbing gyms, as we've seen with the prevalence of uh, people watching sport climbing um, on YouTube, on the Olympic Channel, on ESPN now, even with uh, USA Climbing, that the numbers are showing that people like to watch this. Um, so I, you know, and there's plenty of, of uh, events that have event organizers that have technical delegates that have uh, hired judges. Um, so. I think it, the level of professionalism is continuing to rise and, and I'm hopeful that it continues to get to a point where we are able to accomplish not only good separation from the root setting, um, but also this, uh, this bigger thing. Mm -hmm. Cool. Yeah. We should have ended it on that question, but there is the one last question I have to <laughs> ask, which is if you got to do this all again tomorrow, um, what are the things that you would change? What are those like maybe top three things where you feel that could have performed better or you could have uh, used a different uh, method? Yeah, I think uh, I touched on these a little bit before. One was having uh, a better perspective or context for the audience and, um, and for the live stream uh, so that we had like maybe a little highlight reel of, of Carlo trying problem number four. Carlo and Alex both trying problem number four and not necessarily doing it and and then playing that right before they go out. And and so the audience is able to say like, oh man, it, are they going to be able to do it? And uh, um, that's one of the things I would change. Uh, another thing I would change is to maybe give 30 minutes specifically to finalists instead of having it during the red point qualifiers. Um, or maybe giving it in addition to the red point qualifiers. Okay. Um, so that they're all given uh, a good shot at, at trying to work out the climbs. Um, and yeah, otherwise, uh, the, the other thing that I would change is also more from like a broadcast perspective, which is having that scoreboard. And yeah, I, uh, you know, I, I worked with uh, a volunteer that had put together a scoring app and a timing app and uh, uh, like an overall scoreboard. So they had what was supposed to be displayed at the bottom was uh, the name of the climber, their score for that problem, how much time they had on the boulder. And then over on the right was supposed to be uh, a general scoreboard that updated live with whatever they were getting. Right. Um, and so all of that was supposed to be broadcast in the way. And I, I think at the last minute we had some technical difficulties that prevented it uh, from actually displaying on the live stream. Unfortunately, it happens. Yeah, exactly. It happens. Right. Uh, and as uh, you know, that that's definitely, I think something I would have liked to have seen um, happen. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, I, the, my reflections on it after having watched it, the reason I wanted to talk to you is because, you know, somebody, I'm somebody else that likes to think about formats. And there are a lot of the things that you tried that are similar to some things that I'd love to try at some point too. So I'm really glad you got the opportunity to, to workshop this stuff at PBR. Um, I thought it was 
very successful it the flow of the competition was amazing um you're totally it eliminated rests completely which was awesome to watch there was constant climbing going on which was such a huge success and i'm a big advocate for having ad breaks in comp so it made me really happy that you had those roles for multiple uh, uh sponsors ready to go and they were just running those that's such a great uh starting point um, for these competitions and a really big part of what's going to make them, you know, financially feasible. So uh, I was super impressed yeah. by that. I thought the route setting was great. Um, I was really curious to see how the athletes um, manage the practice time. That was unique for me. Uh, now, the one thing that I couldn't really gauge from my end was the aspect of not having ISO and uh, getting to like watch the climbs or getting to have the audience um uh, like it in, involved in anything. Did you feel like it changed the atmosphere? Did it uh, make it a better atmosphere? Were people like really wild and out in the crowd, just yelling shit? <laughs> <laughs> I think with it being the first time that it had been done, that people were still of the mindset of uh, a little bit reserved in what they could do. And we had the MC uh, kind of, you know, try to relay that to the mm. audience and say like, oh, these climbers have climbed this before. And yeah, uh, loosen up, they, everybody. Yeah, exactly. Uh, but I, I still think that they didn't quite uh, understand that they were able to to really let loose. Okay. Um, so I, I think that that's, you know, something that either comes with time or something that could be communicated better. Um, but in, in either case, I think that it wasn't it wasn't quite there. Um, Climbers are no. too well behaved. They need to, we got to like <laughs> shake them out of that. That's, that's just what we got to do. That's fine. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Cool, man. Uh, so uh, just while you have the chance, uh, you recently broke out, you're doing the freelance thing. It's called complex climbing. Um, do you have any like a uh, website or handles or anything you want to share to anybody? Or do you just want to pitch yourself while you've got the opportunity? <laughs> uh, sure. Yeah. I, unfortunately, I don't have my website up and running. I, I left ABC uh, on good terms, uh, you know, um, I worked with ABC for almost 10 years mm -hmm. and I worked with, uh, climbers like Margo and climbers like, uh, Colin Duffy, who's up and coming, Sean Rabtu, Brooke, um, and sort of went through that whole, uh, cohort, if you will, of, of climbers. Um, and just recently decided to break off and, and do my own thing. Um, but in that process, I sort of like jumped in full speed and have not got a, a website set up. As I mentioned to you before the call, yeah. I was on the road for four weeks. Uh, I had a little bit of a break and then I, I just went to San Francisco and did the national cup up there. Uh, I'm going to Iowa this weekend to do a clinic and a workshop out there. So um, a website will be coming soon, uh, but it's not available yet. So um, yeah. And I mean, if, if anybody out there wants uh, route setting or private coaching or um, any, any sort of consultation for their route setting teams or, or their climbing teams, uh, they can contact me at, uh, at my handle down below. That's my Instagram handle. Or they can talk, contact me at uh, garrett.gregor at gmail.com. Uh, You're just too busy, man. You're like the A-team. You know, If you have a problem and <laughs> you, no one else can help, and if you can find him, Garrett Gregor is your guy. <laughs> Yeah. Cool, yeah. man. I really appreciate your time talking about this. Uh, best of luck on the road. I know you still got a few more things to go. So thank you. Uh, and I'm sure we'll talk soon because I really appreciate people that like talking about this stuff and thinking hard about it. So that's, uh, that's really cool. Uh, for those that were watching, thanks a lot for watching this episode of Plastic Weekly. Make sure you uh, leave a like and subscribe and all that YouTube -y stuff. I appreciate you watching and we'll see you in the next one. Okay.